um, we should be able to to have a pretty pretty solid discussion, I think. So I'll um, I'll, I'll read these questions and then um, any of the others, please uh, please do um, jump in when, whenever you like. Um, first one comes from Robert Parks. Hello, Robert. Uh, the Russian cosmists, art without death, from Russian orthodoxy and Marxism from the nineteenth century to the present day, inspired many Russian key thinkers from Fyodorov to Malevich to the space race of the sixties. What is it to do with the imagination that Russian culture has insight that is unique in the world? Um, very good question, and, and one that I've you know wondered about in terms of literature. But let's let's hear about it in uh, in, in other spheres. Um, who, who, Gleb or, or Buffy? Um, would you like to jump in on that one? Uh, well. Um... Uh, I, I think there is a sort of mystery about Russian mystery, and I think every culture has its own uh, type of knowledge. So, in, in some uh, terms, maybe Russian culture is is different, but also the, the British or I don't know Northern American Indian culture is um, also quite specific and very cosmic. So, uh, I think in in the world, every uh, society or every type of civilization. Uh, brings something uh, that is uh, specific for the area it lives in or develops in. And maybe due to the climatic uh, conditions, which are very much the same on, on the big space of the Eurasia, uh, the culture, the Russian culture developed uh, as a sort of uniform type of, of it, which used to be quite closely connected with the climatic conditions. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, that's, that's, that's my point of view. Yeah, I think that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, let's see, see what the uh, others, here's, here's a good one. Um, in the COVID era, a sense of personal geography has been important to my mental health. Any trip beyond the norm feels expanding and adventurous, whether real or virtual. Has anyone seen a change in art or architecture since our first views from space? The famous blue marble photo, or conversely felt a change in their art since COVID restrictions? Um, Buffy, would you like to, to jump in on that one? Yeah. Um, I would like to say that my work has changed quite a lot in the um, during this period because you tend to work on things that you would never ever have worked on before um, because you're not because it's like a time lapse you can sort of do what you like entertain yourself in the work that you do and it takes you off into a different sort of journey and it's happened with me I've I've um, actually been doing, I mean, my work is about the, the um, natural world, but it's usually quite serious or delicate. Well, instead, because of the situation, I started painting ginormous insects and I would never have done that before. And as I said before, the first thing I did when I did go back to COVID was to paint a dog, which I've never done before. And I think that just leads, leads you into a space where you don't have to think about being commercial or anything or any, anything about or whether it what it's related to you just tend to work on how you feel that day what you want to do what you just want to do and it's much more personal that's what I have to say so I'm going to mute myself now all right Gleb would you like to say something and then I, I'd quite like to hear if, if Yehuda can can let us know about the um the way the art was changed by um space travel Uh, and is is Yehuda here? I I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I I obviously I did not uh, prepare myself for this question, <laughs> but of course art is art is affected by anything that happened in the larger world, so it could not possibly ignore not only the space travel but the idea of space altogether is part of 
uh, especially since the Renaissance, there's so much, you know, from Serrano de Bergerac, there's so much uh, in all cultures concern, <laughs> concerning um, the larger kind of cosmos and the idea that uh, what what the world is like from a from a point of view that is so completely remote from our own has been always a, a very important very important but you know uh, even uh, i mean i don't think that the, the myth of uh, babel uh, with the tower to heaven uh, would have existed without a fantasy about heaven you know i mean the very idea that you can reach somewhere so far away. Of course, the idea that you could actually build a tower to reach heaven, it's already extraordinary. And that myth is, uh, you can see it again and again. I mean, you can see it in, Bo again, Borgel paintings. There is a wonderful uh, Tower of Babel, you know. And I think it is not, uh, there, there, there is not for nothing that Tarkovsky is using so often pictures from Bruegel because he probably felt certain kind of kinship with Bruegel, you know. And Bruegel, one of his greatest paintings is uh, not only uh, Tower of Babel, but uh, at the same time, one can never forget the fall of Icarus. So I think there is a certain kind of, uh, kind of uh, correspondence between the fall of Icarus and the Tower of Babel. They are both inspired by some fantasy about the other world uh, out there. So this, this is what I have to say at this point, yes. In fact, that idea of, of kind of communion between worlds um, comes up, uh, I hope it's in the final cut of our discussion that's going to be shown next week. So. If that's sort of interesting, uh, do make sure to, to check in. Um, there are a couple of, uh, of good responses in the in the chat here. Uh, one from Mavis who says that during lockdown I started working on old pastel sketches of the Arctic, which I'd completely written off. And there's even a polar bear on an ice floe. So thanks for that. And and do keep keep the questions coming. Um, I have to have to admit a mistake um, that I realised quite soon after saying it. Um, in person, which is that Wolf um, was nothing to do with the French Revolution or the uh, Napoleonic Wars. He was in fact dead, I think, before even Napoleon was born. Um, but he did fight the French in Canada, in Quebec, where um, very, you know, America, you know, the very first sort of colonial um, colonial battles were starting to take place. Um, so just a, um, an addendum to that one there. Um, Prislava, hello, um, good to see you here. Uh, mentions in the chat that it's uh, really nice to hear Pirun mentioned as the god of thunder in the Slavic uh, pagan uh, tradition. And the Bulgarian mountain Pirin is named after him. Um, and this actually, you know, reminds me of something that I, I'd just written down. Um, and I don't want to monopolize the conversation here, so I'll definitely sort of ask uh, Gleb and Buffy and maybe Pierre to, to chip in on this one. But um, Seeing the um, seeing the view of of Moscow's cable car, which has definitely um, since has been built since I've been in Moscow, um, and seeing the river reminded me of of how I was looking up London's buried rivers today, um, because um, we obviously know that there's the Thames, but um, there are also several ones: the Fleet, the Lee, the um, was it Walbrook and Langbourne. Um, which have been sort of put underground and now just run underneath the streets of London in in, uh, uh, in sewers or storm drains. Um, but but looking at a map of them, finally you can kind of understand why London's roads are the way that they are. Why, uh, for example, next to Bloomsbury, why uh, Hoban has a, a viaduct, and why Hoban is called Hoban. Um, so, I. I just wanted to sort of open that out a bit more to, to our um, theme of space and to wonder how um, human exploration of space is, is sort of um, shaped by our exploration of, 
the world and by the way we've mapped the world and um, um, how how that sort of <laughs> relates. Um, may may I comment a bit? Please, yeah. Yeah. The the, the first comment is that just during this uh, demonstration of the videos, I thought how how similar Moscow became to modern London with the high rise uh, city and the dome, the Millennium Dome in London and the dome of the Luzhniki Stadium. Um, and also, <clears throat> so it's a uh, multiplication of images all over the world. And um, that's the, the first point. And the second point concerning the COVID, actually this event we have now is the result of the, of, of the um, of what happened, and uh, I think maybe without it, many um, people of um, old age wouldn't uh, join all this um, electronic means of communication. So the situation forced a lot of people to join and maybe to rediscover some other places and maybe to open a bit. Uh, uh, new ways and uh, new places through through the screen or, or, or the computer. And actually, our exhibition in Moscow was opened on 9th of March, uh, one, one year ago. Um, it's the birthday of Gagarin. Um, and for two weeks, it was offline. And then the lockdown was declared. So we had to go online. And it, it resulted in a, in a one-year-long uh, train of events, so, which uh, at the moment ended at Pushkin House, um, quite symbolically. And actually, another point of view is the simultaneity. Oh, at the moment, if I would take it correctly, we're about 30 degrees uh, um, uh, in the, we are standing in, in a 30 degrees angle to each other, because it's two hours difference, so it's 30 degrees. So we, we, would, we would be related to each other in such an angle. Uh, but at the same time, we are still simultaneously in one place with the, with the gravity of the, electro, with the electronic gravity, which is, uh, um, uh, well, based on, on, the, on the screen, not on the gravity of the Earth. Um, that's, that's, that's the funny thing. And also, I think quite a lot of signals are going through the satellites at the, at the moment, not through the cables. Mm. So space is present in an invisible way in our everyday life at, at the moment. Mm, absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think the reason why Moscow and, and London are quite similar is because effectively we're all, you know, human and uh, we, we start to replicate structures um, a bit like how termites make them yeah the same as with saint paul because it's it is modeled on uh, um, brunelleschi's uh, santa maria de fiore and uh, saint peter in uh, uh, in rome and then uh, we have in st petersburg the isaki uh, cathedral yes but they're all like different versions of of one idea of the dome as the as the sky as the as something that uh, presents god on earth but at the moment, there is something, something else that the dome, the new domes present or represent. Yeah, mm. Mm, absolutely. Um, yeah. Football. Yehuda, would you? Would, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Yehuda, what do you? I mean, I, I know you've um, spoken about how how humans write their own culture onto the the. Um, the landscapes that they uh, interact with um, in a very crude way of saying it, I'm afraid, but um, uh, I'm sure you can, you can give us a much uh, better way of, of, of phrasing that. But is there, is there something kind of innate about the way we, we structure our cities and think about the world um, or is it just happenstance that way? I. Uh I don't think it's happenstance. I think it's a very complicated uh, because it is never a simple uh, manifestation. You do see uh, an incredible similarity between the rectangular early city planning in uh, Greek police 
as you see in China. Uh, and this is remarkable that in spite of uh, infinite number of uh, differences, yet when it comes to time planning, there, there are some common elements. As I said, for example, the rectangular idea of the town planning is not uniquely Western. It exists also in China. About the same time, even earlier. So what does it tell you? It doesn't tell you that much. It tells you that, that uh, human beings, as human beings, they have a lot more in common than they themselves imagine. I think that uh, the tendency of different cultures, different tribes and so on is to insist on their uh, particularity rather than accommodate what uh, is a common denominator for all mankind. So I think ultimately all mankind is one kind of, you could say, creature, <laughs> but human beings have the tendency to exaggerate the differences. And when it comes to varying an architecture, similarly, of course, the Eskimos have their you know, have their igloo and the Mongol have their uh, type of tents, which is very different from others. Nevertheless, uh, ultimately, it's not only that Latin Americans have learned from uh, Spanish uh, and Portuguese Baroque, it's also that the Spanish and the Portuguese learn a lot uh, from the Incas and the Aztecs and so on. And I think the process is uh, never ending. And hopefully, perhaps uh, we will be lucky enough that uh, more people would be able to acknowledge their communality and therefore reduce the strife, the war, the antagonism and so on. I mean, look at the Jews and the Arabs in the Middle East, you know. Uh, in fact, they are worshipping to a, a religion that have so much in common. If you read the Quran, it reads like the Old Testament, just different names, different details. But most of the stories are very much the same. And, uh, you know, Allah himself, Muhammad, uh, when uh, he wrote this uh, text, if he indeed was the one who wrote it, uh, acknowledged as much. He saw himself as the one who is coming after. He did not deny the, the precedent of uh, Moses and Jesus also. So, you know, one day I was in, a, in the International Center of uh, India in New Delhi, and there were two, there was a couple there, with a, a woman and a man, who looked very much like a former principal of colleges, something like this. And the two of them were talking about the three religions of the desert. And it was very funny for me because I've heard this expression in archaeological book, but I never heard it in a discussion because there was just kind of peace talks in Madrid or something. And it made me realize how it is being seen from Indian point of view, you know. And indeed, these are the three religions of the desert, and they have more in common than not, especially if you contrast it with Hinduism. And indeed, one of the problems in our world right now is are made of such uh, antagonism, antagonism between Jews and Muslims, antagonism between Hindu and Muslims, you know. Uh, the present uh, prime minister in Hindu is such a, uh, of, of India is such a fanatic Hinduist that he turned the majority into an argument, into a principle of government, which is really absolutely terrible, you know. And, and China and America are on a, on a kind of, uh, on a path of conflict for no other reason except competition for resources and dominance in the world. So what are we to say? I think that uh, that's why I'm so enthusiastic about this project of the cosmos, because I think that one way to move forward is to see 
that the, how should we say, the major elements of our world are not nationally based and no other based on religion. They are much wider than that. And I think this is why this discussion is important and potentially even more important if indeed it would help to produce this consciousness that can overcome these, what I consider minor differences. You know, I don't speak Chinese, but when I'm in China, I'm at home in China just as much as I am in Moscow or New York or Paris or London or Rome. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think um, this great idea in, in science fiction of a kind of um, nationality-less, raceless human race moving into space um, probably is a, is a function of leaving Earth. It's, if, you, if you have to look back at Earth as a tiny blue spot, you can't really see it as a as so 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 different from uh, itself. Um, humans see humans can't see stasis; they can only see the differences in things rather than the similarities. I think and um, leaving Earth allows us to see Earth as as a unit um, much more than staying here would. Um, and I really appreciate your. Um, your view on, on it. I, I think it's, um, yeah, I, it chimes exactly with my thoughts. And uh, we have a couple more questions and it probably isn't too much time for questions. So if you have a burning one, please do get it in and we'll we'll try and wrap up by half past, I think. Um, so uh, Robert again says, I think the Russian imagination is spiritual. Britain has a more subversive dimension, but nihilism was born in fathers and sons. So there is a cross dialogue. I feel the Russian point of view is seldom heard on a global front though. How is the spiritual seen in terms of space? In Britain we link it to Christianity, where God comes from. Um, I think we should probably ask Gleb about this but um, for my part I would say there's probably as much debate within Russia as there is between Russia and Britain. Um, but uh, Gleb, how, how do the Russians consider space? Uh you know, the, uh, I think in, in the last 25 years, the Russian culture change, uh, changed much more uh, than in the uh, 70, year, 70 years after the revolution. And um, basically, I think in, in common, the uh, Russian society at the moment is uh, more concerned with the material things than with the spiritual one, uh, ones. And also... Uh, but there is a small part of the society that that is uh, uh, they are not only orthodox. You know, there is a dialogue between the Muslims and the Orthodox. There, actually, for example, in Moscow, most of the workers are from Kyrgyzstan, and uh, uh, they they have they they have the nomad culture. They basically they were um, how, how to say worshiping sun and fire. Uh, before they joined the uh, Soviet Union, you know that was the main religion. Uh, and actually, what I what I see uh, uh, in their behavior, they are more, they respect much more older people, and they're actually much more respectful, and they help each other. You know, when when this um, lockdown started, everyone in Moscow was uh, concerned that there will be more crime between the this um, gas turbine. Gastarbeiters, but actually they they have an official permission to work uh, without any special documentation because th it's the union of I think Kyrgyzstan and Belarusia and Russia, so you can move easily and work a, a, in any place. But um, vice versa, they they were losing uh, their workplaces, that, but they were helping each other and uh, actually. Uh, they demonstrate this uh, principle of mutual help, which is being lost in the modern, at least, uh, megapolis Russian society. And uh, having experience in, uh, of studying in, in London, for example, I can say that a lot of uh, British and uh, European students I studied with helped me a lot. Uh, so, and returning to space, Clementine is commenting, uh, 
it's it's also very different in different areas of Russia. For example, in the north, um, uh, Christianity is very much related, uh, connected with the paganism and with the feeling of the space as a whole. Um, and for example, the south of Russia, which actually was developed much later, uh, has quite a how to say undeveloped understanding of space. And uh, I think in the next. Uh, a video we will have on the 18th of March. Uh, Vadim Rabik uh, rises up this the, the this problem of uh, Russia not acquiring the the space mentally, you know. Uh, and in many ways, we are trying to to find the the ways how to do it. And there are some communities who are moving from the cities. Okay, that's it. Mm -hmm. And. Yeah, I'll I'll read out Clem's comment. Uh, thank you yeah. very much, Clem. That was that was absolutely brilliant. Um, Clem says um, on the connection between space space and religion in Russia. Fyodor, one of the fathers of cosmism, believed our main task on Earth was to all prepare ourselves for the day of judgment, when all the dead would rise and come back to Earth, and we had to prepare enough space on Earth for them. Um, which, you know, can't rule it out. Um, oh. Yeah, here's one of the cultural difference because uh, we 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 use uh, for for the word space, uh, meaning the space which is around us, we we use the word prostranstvo, and for the space which is uh, above around the earth, we use the word um, cosmos. So, and these are two different things. And I was I I made the wrong connection or maybe it was the connection no i mean in english in english i think it comes from milton the idea that that space is uh the, we use the word for space i think before it was also either cosmos or heavens or yes it's, it's greek word mm. yeah. and actually cosmos is is opposite to chaos uh, and cosmos is something that is space that is organized uh, and it can mean anything that is around us around us ecumena oh I, I don't know how to pronounce it correctly in english like in cosmetica cosmeticus ah, yeah yeah um so uh and uh, i think malevich uh, with his architectons uh, he tried to fight with gravity and created this idea of uh, architecture in space and that was uh, there was a whole um group of people uh, trying to design for the space uh, objects for the space and then one of the events that uh, Fyodorov library uh, held uh, there was a discussion of the um, film by the early soviet um, filmmaker uh, i think in 1928 he imitated the um, weightlessness in, in his film very precisely with, with all the effects of slow motion and hanging around losing top top and bottom uh, uh, so and also Tsiolkovsky who lived in Kologa in, in his village house he also described the low weight uh, on on the moon um, very precisely in terms of uh, physical uh, ethics and feelings uh, and the cosmonauts that flew to space said that it, it was a very precise description also as the weightlessness uh, Tsiolkovsky described in one of his uh, writings uh, so it's it's the force of imagination uh, in uh, at, uh, at a certain point but one of the links that I tried to make Spartium yeah uh, but one of the links that I tried to make uh, between space and uh, Earth was the actually the um, the life of the first cosmonaut Gagarin and of Tsiolkovsky because they lived in a in a small timber houses and uh, um, when you when it's minus forty outside you have to um, put a lot of clothes on you and you actually if you if you it, it's like going in the outer space when you leave the house in winter. Uh, and I had this experience of being in minus 42, so it's, it's quite uh, uh, extreme. Uh, uh, and that was, that was trying, uh, my, I was trying to, to make the link 
and how this uh, climate and this experience, rough, uh, extreme experience, actually um, moved people to uh, to the space. Because moving to Siberia was was about the same. You know, huge spaces with quite with with quite a rough um, climate. Um, Hmm. So, yeah, I think it's definitely. But a, but but, but, uh, but British culture is a, is a, is a sea culture in many ways. So um, there are also very very specific um, how to say features in, in in the British character, which which I can point after a bit of thinking. Uh, you know, uh, I think that going o- going always is meant uh, that you may not see your relatives for never. Uh, whether in Russia, we're, we're always on, on, on the soil, on the surface, and uh, you always feel this connection. You have to move along the surface, and uh, it's, it's not uh, uh, that dangerous. Uh, and that also means that, for example, in British culture, you can, I don't know, disappear for 10 years and then appear as if you, you've, you've gone a, a few days ago. You know? uh, it's, it's a li- there are some little things. But at the same time, I think every British living uh, not on the British Isles, he, he might be dreaming of, of a small ho- of a small cottage in the countryside. Uh, and also, uh, London is very, very different from many other cities due to his to its um, uh, streets. The streets uh, they are not linear, and they actually follow the surfaces and maybe. Um, as, as far as I know, the, the story of London, the history of London, it is uh, a lot of, it consists of a lot of villages connected together. And the villages were formed by the, um, um, that were formed by the, by, by the horse movement, because the horses would choose the, the proper uh, slope angle uh, to 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 move easier, uh, as well as uh, I don't know, Brittany is formed by this by this type of uh, making the so- uh, making the soil with, with, with the horse and plow. Mm. Um, yeah, I can say actually, um, you only understand why roads are the shape they are in Britain if you walk between cities, um, because you immediately realize why cities are where they are. Um, they're at the top of a hill, about a day's walk away from each other. Yeah, yeah, um, so yeah. you need to sort of get down on the level of it to to, to realize you can't really see on a map. Maybe you can if you yeah. have a map with, yeah. with rivers and, and contours, but uh, experiencing it is what, is what gets you to understand it. There are loads of good uh, points here, and I want to get, get through them. I think we can probably go over a little longer. If you have to duck out... Um, at any time we will we are recording it so we can send you a recording um but uh let's 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 go through these questions um uh the mars society ran a contest regarding the planning of a city on mars everything that had to be considered is fascinating how to live in an extremely different environment but also feel at home as we understand it um i think it is going to you know humans are gonna if we when we go to space have to be um, human about it we're going to Im- imprint our own um, structures and our processes on on whatever we whatever we do um, and and Clem's uh, point here is really interesting actually um, which is somewhat similar it's about the fantasy cottage at the uh, at the end of Master and Margarita fantasy cottage in space um, it's a very human homely uh, thing somewhere completely alien but is it a fusion of english and russian space culture uh, I, I cannot tell you know uh, i guess it's 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 the desire to escape that's what i would say mm-hmm. and as concerning the settlements on mars uh, we had uh, this project called Dis- dispersion it that was um, like a, an alternative to urbanism uh, and uh, our uh, the member of our group the economist he um, asked him to calculate how much would one kilogram of potatoes cost um, to grow on Mars? So it was something about $47 million per kilogram. 
So can you imagine how much resources we 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 will we will have to spend simply to um, deliver stuff to Mars and then to grow? Uh, and if, if so, and and the apple tree was something like three hundred million. Mm. Yeah, Mars might be a bit of a stretch um, for now. I yes. think that the idea of finding another world, another yeah. version of Earth, is, is is very interesting. That we would yeah, just. But I, I, I think we still have quite uh, sufficient resources here if they will would be spread uh, more uh, equally and thoughtfully, um, because we have a lot of technologies that can allow us to study the ecosystems and uh, actually uh, to understand them better uh, and uh, maybe we could uh, then um, uh, sort of build ourselves in to these ecosystems not to be the aliens uh, and that's what Timothy Ingold uh, talked a bit in the end of his uh, uh, speech in, uh, which you will see on the 18th of my of my yeah. I'll, I'll just try and get through the last couple of questions yep. or, or comments um mavis says that she was looking for the tallest building in nook the capital of greenland and it's only eight stories high um so obviously all all uh, skyscrapers are, are relative i think um and adam's got a comment here which is very um very interesting there may be objective correlates for subjective representations of reality we seem to be embedded in our own subjective models of the world and the cosmos. Maybe the topological concept of the parallax can help us to integrate relativistic models and perceptual prisms with a more universal and even absolute standpoint that can stabilize and advance our future evolution as a species and civilization. Um, I, I, it's definitely over my head. I think the point um, of, of coming to an absolute um, understanding of the universe um, may be possible um if you if you take humans as a um as a eusocial species um where we're all influenced by others perceptions but i think because we are uh at least in this age and, and there are debates as to whether it's always been this way we're individuals now um i don't know if we'll ever reach an absolute consensus about anything um but co collaboration between cultures like um between britain and russia or between individuals um i think is a is a good enough replacement for being able to actually see through each other's eyes um and one last thing here before we before we wrap up um and thank you for all your your attention it's been it's been a good hour and a half but i think it's um it's been a really interesting one uh, if you see the proposed martian cities it would probably make most people want to fix our approach to keeping earth healthy mm, absolutely um and i'll i think we'll probably have to wrap it up there i i um i can see even more good questions but i think um many of them are relevant to next week's discussion um so uh please do tune in to that. Um, it's, it's been a real pleasure for me. Um, I've, I've tried not to be too embarrassed about my um, inane comments <laughs> earlier, but um, thank you, uh, Gleb. Uh, thank you, Buffy, um, as well, and Yehuda. And um, though they're, they're not here today, but um, uh, uh, Marina and Michal as well, um, both absolutely brilliant uh, contributions and and to pierre as well who who um who, who spoke during the the video um i i well if it was inspiring thank you that's um it's a very nice comment um it's, it's definitely been inspiring to me i've been i, I really loved uh, hearing these sort of bouncing around ideas um and and they will they will continue i hope um so thank you all for joining and uh, see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Rafi. Bye. Bye.